And we are back here in studio with a big guest. I've been a little bit nervous about it, ladies and gentlemen, because it's not often you get to see Mike Hilton out in the wild. But he is joining us right here in studio. Thank you so much for coming and sitting down. Well, talk thanks, with us. thanks for asking me. I've enjoyed watching your career grow and and you in the sport, and I, I appreciate the offer. So, where there's some hot topics, let's address the elephant in the room. What is your opinion on some of these drivers being outspoken? Well, we've we've always had personalities in the sport. Sometimes it's it's different, but you know we have got some strong personalities and and. We we listen to everybody, every stakeholder in the sport. We have an open door policy for it. Most of that works. Every now and then, you get for whatever reason, it doesn't work, and so they feel the best way to communicate their issues is not directly with us, but through the media or through digital and social, which is kind of a modern version of of the consumption of all of our sport on and off the racetrack and so we we, we have that but it, it's 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 i think it's unfair to us knowing that we're working on all these things and we'll be glad to communicate with the ones that want to do it their way uh, and and if 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 there's a sincere and they're factual about what they say that's one thing but when they say only part of it and not all the facts along with it i just don't think that's fair for the league and and it's unfortunate, but yeah. it's it's a modern day part of way of communicating or or staking your 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 issue in the ground. Yeah. Well, like, what did some guys back in the early '90s? How like when there were some prickly topics? How were they generally handled? In your in your opinion, the correct way. So, more often than not, it was in in the conversations. We spent a lot of time at the garages. And the racetracks, it'd be four or five day shows. So you would communicate a lot at the racetracks. And and throughout time, and particularly COVID and post-COVID, we don't spend as much time. But but I do know that that through Steve Phelps and Steve O'Donnell's leadership and Ben Kennedy and and the folks at the R and D Center that there are multiple chains of communication to replace the fact that we don't spend as much time together at the racetrack. And and for the most part it works, but it's it's kind of like city hall meetings or something. The the citizens walk away and say, "Well, I don't know if they heard us or not." And so there's then there's a lot of dialogue back and forth. But to your question, um, it, back in the day, you would you would do it more often, and it it could be unpleasant, but you would do it um, kind of out of sight. And and if if there were issues that they were pretty strongly uh, I was trying to think of the right terminology, but some issues they would be more right than we were, and we just didn't get it. And so they would show us on the racetrack, and they say, "Oh, now we know what they're talking about." They didn't have to verbalize it. They would show. He said, "If you don't do this, this is what's going to happen." And we'd say, "Okay, well, we'll you know we'll take a look at it," and then and they'd come back and say, "You better you better do this, or this is what's going to happen." And so they would make it happen and show us on the racetrack and say, okay, we got it. And then that's the way we kind of work things out. It's it's just different when you've got digital and social media today and it's it's so popular and it's so, you know, content driven and, and appreciated, I guess, uh, for the sake of another term. Arguably nobody's seen the sport go through all the changes that you have from 1980, but going to Bristol as a kid, like you mentioned before, How's the sport changed? Not even bef- like before you were the guy running the show when you signed up to be a PR director at Atlanta in 1980. How has the sport progressed broadly? I guess. Yeah, it, it. I think the the biggest thing is the content being able to be consumed. So the first time I realized that there was NASCAR races. We consumed it through a radio, and we'd sit there and we'd listen to Barney Hall or whoever was was explaining the race at Martinsville or Richmond or or Daytona even, um, and we were we were consuming the sport through them telling the story of it. So when they built the Bristol track, and you could literally go see a racetrack at a, a cup level, uh, and we had a lot of tracks around 
Bristol and the Southwest Virginia, East Tennessee, that you could go see weekend racing or sportsman racing back then. And, and they were fun and they were exciting. Uh, but when you saw that first big track that they built in Bristol, you thought, oh, crap, you know, there's Richard Petty, there's Kill Yarbrough, there's David Pearson. Uh, people you would hear about on the radio, now you're seeing them in action. And that's the that's the biggest driving force, I think, that our sport has, is you can consume it on the radio, you can consume it on television. But until you're at the racetrack and you hear it and smell it and feel it in person, that's, that's where I think uh, we do our best. But all the forms of consumption of our sport over the generations uh, has, has, has changed it. Uh, a lot of it for the good. Some of it is we struggle with every now and then. But I remember in the 80s, um, the urban markets had cable television, but the rural markets were growing in cable and cable channels were developing, and they needed content. And we were good content for, for the early days of, of cable television, whether it was Turner or, or uh, Black Diamond or, or different groups that, that were looking for content to put on the cable sport, particularly cable sports and live sports. And it wasn't until sometime in the 80s that the entire NASCAR National Series, the Cup Series primarily, that's the only one we had back then that was a National Series, was aired completely the entire season live. There were some shows that were live. There were some that were tape delayed. There were some part of a a, a Saturday afternoon sports broadcast on the on the big networks. But in the 80s, as cable and, and uh, that grew up, we grew up with it and gave us the chance to be exposed that helped our sport get bigger and bigger along the way. You, you bring up the, the regional TV market. The My favorite piece of NASCAR memorabilia is a signed 1979 Daytona 500 fight pitcher. So where were you watching that? Watching race? it from Bristol. Watching it from Bristol? I was watching it in <laughs> Bristol that weekend. And, and, yeah, that was the first time the race had ever been covered from green to checkered, start to finish. And then you had that kind of finish, and you said, holy crap, this is pretty cool. <laughs> He's even got the, the – it was the fireman. That was separating. Oh, yeah. Get this, dude. It's my prized possession. So <clears throat> Jim Nedland was a track worker pull, pulling Bobby Allison and uh, Donnie's grabbing on to Kale's leg. Uh, Jim moved. He was next door neighbors with my grandfather in a tire, retirement community down in Florida. So I've got the only signed picture of the fight with everybody, including the track. Including him. That's, that's great. I think that there's nobody in the sport. So you came in as president in 2001, but from 2000 to 2001, there's nobody – through that era, it was rough, and there's nobody that had moved the needle on safety in their sport as much as you have between soft walls and driver safety. And even when you look at pit road with helmets and, and fire suits for all the guys, how much with – we obviously know way more about concussions and things like that now where the days of Ricky Rudd taping his eyeballs open are, are long gone because we're just smarter yeah. across all sports now. Yeah. How much when you see maybe a – conversation about safety come up do you get involved with uh you know o'donnell or, or those guys that are in charge now well we we still talk a lot and i'm i've, I've got great faith in the leadership we've got all the way uh, with phelps and o'donnell and ben kennedy but but john probe scott miller everybody at the r&d center and how that that r&d center kind of got created around you know hey we gotta we gotta figure out what's going on here and and the only way to really figure it out is focus on it, stay, have a group that stayed on it. And that was the origination of the R&D Center back in 2000, 2001. Uh, but I got a lot of faith in the current leadership of the sport, but particularly the leadership around competition and the leadership around doing everything we can every day to, to make the sport safer. And it is a lot safer today, but this still is a very dangerous sport. And, and uh, perfect storms can happen or just an accident uh, at a racetrack can still happen, and it's still a very dangerous sport. So that, that topic of safety is chased every day, eight, ten hours a day at the R&D Center through every, through every opportunity you get to take a car back from a racetrack, like, unfortunately, the seven car in Talladega, and, and say, why did this happen? You know, and sometimes the answers are easy. Sometimes the answers aren't easy to find. But you constantly chase that topic, and so when the topic of safe race car comes up in the NASCAR race, and and people say these cars aren't safe, I, 
I know that NASCAR is not going to put an unsafe car on the racetrack. Now, it may have different characteristics. It may act differently. And if it does, and and that that is is something that we need to correct, then we're going to work with the garage area and figure out how to do that. Uh, but we're not we're not going to we're not going to accidentally. If it does, it's a it's a huge mistake. Not not it's not even an accident. And but there's no way in the world we're going to put something on the racetrack that we don't feel safe with. Well, and you you touch on the that word leadership, and there were some critical comments just using that word bad leadership which I don't agree with. I think a lot of people also echo that statement of nobody agrees with that statement, but behind the scenes of what you don't mind to share, what the leadership guys you're talking about, John Probst on the competition side, Scott Miller, Steve Phelps, Ben Kennedy, what direction are those guys pushing the sport to with the new TV deal, media rights deal, and just the overall competition of the sport? Well, so right, wrong, or indifferent, good, bad, or ugly, however you want to put it, for 75 years, NASCAR has been the steward and the the responsible holder and actor of our sport, our form of motorsports. And and we've learned a lot, but we still have a lot to learn, and we know that. I do know that our leadership is focused on doing everything for every stakeholder in the sport to come out right. And when somebody challenges the leadership, I think they stop very short of understanding everything that's going on and why it goes on and putting all those pieces of the puzzle together. Most everybody understands it. We have a lot of dialogue Monday through Thursdays away from the racetrack about not agreeing on this or agreeing on that uh, with with teams and, and crew members and drivers and car owners and, and other entitlement uh, stakeholders and fans even every day and and we take all that in and we we're we're city hall and city hall's not going to be popular when it when somebody's looking for somebody to point to mm-hmm. uh but but we're still the ones that are the, the responsible for delivering the best possible solution for every stakeholder we've got in our sport yeah i think that is the most challenging thing to me as a you know at, drivers in the sport or crew chiefs or crew guys or team owners or even the media everybody sees it from their perspective where you have to see it from everybody's and that's that's the toughest thing that i would think that your role would be but having to deal with like having to deal with running a league there's probably only 50 people in the world that have ever had to deal with that much on their plate what are the hardest things like is it dealing with the drivers is it dealing with the media who is the who is the toughest to deal with <laughs> Uh, drivers well for, yeah well it was bunch his of prima, dad bunch but, of prima donnas <laughs> oh no. i live with him oh yeah I, no. I, I can promise you that no, randy randy was was very educational yeah <laughs> uh, still is still we uh, get it yeah. every day oh yeah he educates me on a daily basis <laughs> <laughs> but it, it 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 media is tough but they have a f- purpose and and they're they've got their job and and for anybody in the sports entertainment business rely on media, whether it's a broadcast partner or uh, a journalist or now digital social uh, that, that drives the coverage of the sport. You want that. And, and you want it to be good, but you also have to realize that it's not always going to be that way. And, and their coverage of the sport relies on the other stakeholders of the sport, whether it's the fans team owners, racetrack operators, and drivers. Well, drivers have got the biggest stage and the most loud voice. The biggest microphone. They've got the they got the biggest microphone and in the older days we said they got all they got the barrel full of the black ink that that can get mm. published. Yeah. And and today it's the microphone, but then they got the camera time, and then now it's the digital social spaces and everything. It's the tweeter and, now too. Yeah, and and but we, that's just part of our sport that that I you know I would have more trouble dealing with it. I think the era that I was the president of the sport or even charge of competition was much easier to be that than we have now that Steve Phelps and Steve O'Donnell and Ben Kennedy have because it's much more complicated today. What were some things when you were running the league there for almost two decades that made you lose sleep? Uh, the the things that, that really 
somebody getting hurt on the racetrack was was devastating. Uh, and then calls that were made, and and particularly calls that were made by mistake, that that changed the outcome of a of a race. They were really difficult to to deal with. Um, case in point, if I got a second, I'll tell you one real quick one. You got plenty of seconds for Andy, you. Andy Andy Petrie could get into this one, and and he and I joke about. Well, we we can now, but it's been a long <laughs> time ago. Rockingham, um, toward the end of the season, and Andy is a tire changer on the three car, but he's also kind of like quasi crew chief, but he's also a tire changer. And in those days, the guys would paint the, the – well, they still do paint them yellow, but that was just beginning to be part of the trend back then. And so the yellow lug nuts were the ones that were glued up to the wheels. The extra ones that a tire changer would carry were were either steel or black, you know, whatever. So the three car comes in, black wheels, yellow lug nuts, zip, zip, zip. And our, our pit official sees only four yellow lug nuts. And we have to call the, the three car back in because there's a lug nut missing. So in those days when we didn't have cameras and everything else, we had a, an official, particularly in the ones that were in the points battle late in the season, that that, that would, would scour that car during pit stops. And our official said, this car is missing a lug nut. So we call the three car back in. It's a black lug nut because Andy was arguing with the official. Said, "No, I had to take one out of my mouth to put it on the wheel, and it was black." But our official swore in his head that there was only four lug nuts because he could only see four yellow ones. But Andy was right. So now the three car is down. So Bill Jr. was in the control tower that day, and and we talked about it and so we decided to go ahead and throw a caution and put the three car back on the lead lap we kept pit road closed and the only thing the three car was supposed to do we weren't going to be able to put him back exactly where he might have been if he came off of pit road correctly because these were green flag stops and but we we brought him back in actually it might have been a caution it just took us several green flag laps to finish it out so we 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 threw the caution said the three car gets his lap back well, and pit road was closed. And when back then, when pit road is closed and you pit, you went to the back of the line on a restart. Well, Dale was smart enough to figure out in Rockingham, after about 25 or 30 laps, that that I'm going to come in and take tires. I don't care because I'm in the back of the field and I need tires to catch up. Well, he comes down pit road to change tires. And so now we got to open up pit road. I mean, so that's one of those things where drivers teach you how to make the rules of the the road or the race. Mm. And and that one is the one that I lost two or three nights sleep over because it impacted the finish of the three car potentially. But it was just it was just one of those things that trying to correct it made it more complicated. But at the end of the day we you know we we laugh about it to Richard and, and Andy and uh we'll kinda of bring it up and laugh about it. But it it's it wasn't funny that at that moment. Well you you mentioned obviously the three car I wanna tie that back in with the the saying used what was the uh the black ink barrel full of black ink it didn't seem like dale was a barrel full of black ink kind of guy so how would he go try to get a point across he was trying to make he would he, and that's why i think he was always a good friend of bill jr's and he was a good friend of mine but he 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 would eat our lunch uh but it, it it's like racing against him on Sunday, and he'd move you out of the way. First guy to call you Monday morning was going to be him. <laughs> he'd call Dale Jarrett. He'd call Rusty Wallace. He'd call Ricky. He'd call whoever, Darrell Walter even. He'd, he'd, everybody that he had to move out of the way to win a race or get up there, he'd call him the next day and say, look, I, you know, we, we make a living off this sport kind of type thing. He'd do the same thing with us. He did our lunch a little bit during the broadcast when he knew he had his voice. Uh but he would call us six o'clock on Monday morning. If my phone rang, it was either Bill Jr. or Dale Earnhardt. And and but he would he would go behind the scenes and say, "Look, this is what builds this sport." This and he was right. Those those types of things that he would do on the racetrack or would would hold us accountable for publicly. He was right that those things are part of the sport growing, and and that's why he was such a big impact on 
us as a league, but also us as a driver. The the change in the guard, I feel like Jeff Gordon was another guy who was like the baton from Dale handed to Jeff, more or less. So how would Jeff handle certain things that he was perturbed about? In the same fashion, but but so Dale was a good Southern gentleman with uh, with a Southern streak in him. Jeff was a, a good West Coast or Indianapolis type gentleman. So, so he might Yankee. do it. He might do it differently, and you felt a little bit better when you walked away from Jeff. When sometimes Dale Senior would walk away, and you felt like <laughs> you just been beat up with a baseball bat or something. <laughs> uh, but but Jeff and and what gave both of them the ability to to do that was their credentials. I mean, they did, they weren't coming in there saying, "Look, you know, this is this is all screwed up because they wanted an advantage." They already had the advantage, and they say, "Look, this is." This is not right for us to be able to do this and so and so not be able to do it type thing. I I've heard an interview when Dale passed. There was a little bit of a time, a time lapse there of a change of the guard before you thought Jeff was ready. You had Rusty and Dale Jarrett and Terry Labonte kind of take that role and split it. But his dad always says it like Corey ain't gonna listen to me, so I have to have somebody else tell him. Now if there was a group of drivers that were kind of complaining about one thing and didn't see the full scope of it instead of you being like having a town hall meeting would you ever just go to dale or or jeff and be like can you explain this to these guys and and get them back on your side yes and they did it be the other way too they'd all go to dale and then to jeff and and say can you go to these guys and explain to it that they've got it messed up mm -hmm. so yes there's always a senior driver in the garage area and i've seen this over three generations that that you can go to and say, look, you know, we're not going to make it make sense. Yeah. Uh, can you go help them understand it? And then, though, occasionally when a younger driver comes along, they say the older drivers will say, look, we we've, we've tried. You go talk to them. So we kind of do it back and forth in 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 those days. Is Ooh. there is there anybody that's surprising that we wouldn't think of? Like we we obviously think of the Dales, Jeff Gordon's, Rusty Wallace. Is there somebody that was a little bit more quiet about it that we would be surprised that took that role that wasn't? That was a little bit more unassuming. No, I think it was kind of obvious. You know, the uh, even when Senior was was the guy that everybody would go to to argue with us over stuff, there were other drivers that would have conversations with us, and we, yeah. you know, obviously we'd pay attention to them because they were race car drivers, but they were successful race car drivers. Kyle Petty, Rusty Wallace, Dale Jarrett, Terry Labonte, and Bobby, who were Terry was ultra quiet about the whole his whole career. Uh, so you could almost, you'd almost have to call a Terry Labonte up and say, look, what, what, what is this? And then he would be, you know, he'd be glad to tell you if you, if you asked him about it, Matt Kenzo was kind of the same way. Um, but there, there were all along, there was always all, all generations had drivers more than just one, but the, the big voices was Dale senior. And then there was a void and then it became Jeff Gordon. Uh, a lot of people thought that Dale Jr., but Dale really didn't come to the hauler a lot about issues. He just said, "Tell me what I got to do, and I'll go race." And 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 Corey, you're you know Corey, like his dad would come up there and argue just to distract us, so his team was off doing something. Corey just comes up and said, "Hey, how you guys doing? What's going on? Anything I can do for you?" I just generally like asking your opinion, see well, what's going on, well, keep you, a pulse on. Yeah, but you make. You make that's easy for me to say yes to you, whether it's yeah. a softball tournament or doing this, because you're you're sincerely just happy to be here. Yeah, yeah, and I hope to remain that way through the course of my career, and <laughs> not forget that, right? Because I am happy to be here. But we talk about drivers going to the league <clears throat> to voice concerns, voice changes. Was there anybody that yourself, when you were running the show, went to for like business advice? or outside of the sport to get a better understanding to how to apply it to our sport? Yeah, they were, they were obviously, I was fortunate enough to, to be part of the sport through the Bill Jr. and Jim France, I think, or a lot of people are getting to know Jim France better now, but Jim's always been there and he is a sound mm -hmm. of, of, a, of a custodian of all this is anybody I've ever seen, including his brother. But Bill Jr., I had the, the benefit of having a lot of influence and mentorship from Bill Jr. But 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 watching the way Bill Jr. did it, you you could go outside of the industry 
and ask somebody that you had a lot of confidence in that, you know, f helped me understand it. And they knew nothing about the sport, but they knew a whole lot about the situation and they could help you through it. I love talking about like watershed moments, whether that's that one call that you get that when all the opportunities are drying up or, you know, it, something breaks where you chose to do one thing, go this one place or decided to not go against it and just change the trajectory of your life. But you were a part of the sport and also leading the sport of when it went from like a Southeast niche sport. Some people didn't even acknowledge it as to a national phenomenon, but what was there a race? Was there a moment where you're like, Oh hell, we got something pretty good here, boys. <laughs> well, it, it, to me, it's been all alone. And and my whole career is just nothing spectacular. Just I just happened to be at the right place at the right time. Uh, like I was talking about the coverage of the sport, I was involved in the sport. My my watershed moment was when I was at Atlanta Raceway. That that was in those days. Most tracks were independently owned. Uh, the France family had Daytona and Talladega, uh, and then it grew from there. Uh, the Smith family had Charlotte, and it grew from there. But it, but but in the 70s and 80s, most of the facilities were all independent, and Atlanta was independent back then. Uh, the common owner was L.G. DeWitt that owned Rockingham. Him and his family owned all of Rockingham. He owned half of Atlanta, and then Walt Nix on the other half. And and um, in November of 85, I'm sitting there talking to Les Richter and Jim Hunter, and and. And we were talking about, and they asked if I'd be interested in coming to work for, for the France family. And I said, because I'm looking at it as a young guy in the business and the one family that made a living off of this sport every day when they got up and, and went to sleep at night was the France family. They didn't have any outside resources. It was all the sport itself. And and a lot of the other independent ownerships had outside resources and the racetrack was an opportunity to have fun at on the race weekends and everything. And I said, yeah, I said I would be. And so we, that kind of worked out. And then after we ran the all-star race in May of 86, I went to work for the, for the France family. And, but that decision at that moment to go to work for the France family was my opportunity that I look back at. And, and it was the smartest thing I ever did. Um, and never looked back from that day on. And then you look you look through the sport and all the moments we had, whether it was the coverage, the expansion, the opportunities that we had to go into Chicago or Kansas City, Indianapolis, New Hampshire, different corners that we had the opportunity to grow in. That all came about at, at uh, the time that, again, I was just lucky to be there and be part of that growth of the sport as we go to those places or Vegas or Miami and and Roger Penske puts Southern California back together after we lost the opportunities to race there. Um, all that just kind of happened that, that all played a big part of growing the sport uh, through that, that period. So we've been around Ben Kennedy quite a bit. Corey raced with him in the East days and just sitting back watching what he's doing with the, with the rope that he's given. How, how important is it to you? You touched on working with the France family, working with Bill Jr. and being around them and bridging that gap to, you know, Ben obviously didn't have the relationship with, with them that you do. And you're somebody that has been here through the, through the heyday of everything and seen so many changes in the sport. How do you keep him, if, if he's the one that takes over, how do you keep him grounded with the, you know, the, the fundamentals of the sport, but also, uh, I guess, with the blinders off enough to, to move it to his generation? Yeah, I th and I think I give Br uh, I give Ben most of the Ken uh, the uh, credit himself. Uh, he grew up around it, obviously, um, and and could have gone in any direction. He could have done anything. You know, his father was a a dentist, plastic surgeon. His mother was involved heavily in the sport from her early years. He chose to be involved in the sport, whether it was. Some kid hawking souvenir magazines one weekend, and then he grew up enough to, to go off and do other things in the sport. He chose to do that. So that told you a lot right there when he decided that that's, that's what he wanted to do. His, his style and his ability and his common sense 
all kind of comes together. But the, the, the strongest asset in him enjoying what he does in this sport and people watching him do it and, and him convincing us old folks to maybe think a little bit out of the box comes from his, again, it's, it's just his sincerity about wanting to be a, a, a player in the sport. And that's our fourth generation. But it's 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 our first in two that that actually set in the wheel of a race car. So he he knows that he he knows what it's like to drive a race car. He knows what it's and to win races. He knows what it's like to work at a racetrack and and understands the the trials and tribulations. He still owns a race team, and so he knows the trial and tribulations of an ownership. At least you know even at the level that he does it at, and he brings all of that from the background into the office every day and the sport benefits from that the, the entire sport benefits and the older he gets the more it's going to benefit and and i don't think we had to teach him much because he's a good listener he'll ask when he he has something he needs help with uh, but him and steve phelps and steve o'donnell really gel well together and his love and passion for what happens at the racetrack transferring to what happens behind the scenes is the greatest greatest asset NASCAR can have going forward. We already see some of the fruits of Ben Kennedy's labor specifically with the LA Coliseum, the Clash Race temporary <coughs> track there. 75th anniversary next year. We're going to a football field in LA, a street course in Chicago. We cover bristle with dirt, right? The league is more flexible than it's ever been in terms of facilities we go to. So I want to ask you, how much more flexible can we be with potentially more temporary venues, international races in the future, you know, from going from year 75 to year 85? Like, yeah. where's the direction of the sport go there? I, I, I would tell you that it's open-ended. I don't think there's any limitations anymore. And I think, I think what we're seeing in our sport, and it's tough for a, an older guy to look at it or an older fan even – uh, to look at it and say, what in the world are these guys doing? But but when you do look at it through a modern lens and through the eyes of a Ben Kennedy and, and his generation, you get the fact that the world is like that today. The world is more instantaneous. The the the, the gaining knowledge is, you know, I'd have to go to a library or or borrow somebody's do encyclopedia they, to they look up some. Do they even have libraries anymore? <laughs> I've got, it's not, they're not the same, I yeah. promise you. Uh, but, but, uh, today's world, I think the consumption of every, every type of, from shopping to entertainment, um, is is different. And and looking at it and given, and Ben Kennedy has the ability to to show us through his eyes what makes it different. And flexibility is one of the biggest things, and that's why I think it's just it's open ended. So we were talking about before we jumped on here about <clears throat> Ryan running a street stock in North Wilkesboro, right? That's also a race we didn't talk about. Also and race same, yeah. back there. Yeah. Like, are you kidding me? That's yeah. a NASCAR fan's dream. But I went, we had the bus there. We were supporting our buddy. We had friends and family. And an event like that filled my cup as a fan of the sport, like a true, like, nitty-gritty, this is why I'm doing it, because I just love to do it, as opposed to making it a job. So I was wondering, with your day-to-day -day roles being less of just the carrying the direction of the sport, has it allowed you to become a fan again? I've, I've never stopped being a fan, but it, it allows me to be more of a fan than have to be focused on, okay, you can't be a fan when you make this decision. Now I get to go back to being more of a fan. But in the meantime, what I've enjoyed um, is spending time with, with the Jim France and the family on the IMSA brand or the ARCA brand or even the flat track dirt bike uh, brand. And now quarter midgets. Yeah. And now quarter midgets <laughs> with the uh, – with the USAC folks. So those are the things that I, I now get to look back at and remember why I become a fan. You you guys are talking about going to Wilkesboro and saying, oh my gosh, this is why I love this sport. Well, think about my generation. First time they drove through the tunnel at Daytona said, holy crap, I'm now, I'm at Daytona. And so that's, that's what builds enthusiasm. There's a lot of folks that went to the LA Coliseum in 2022 that became a NASCAR fan. We saw that a few mm -hmm. weeks later at, at Auto Club Speedway when those ticket buyers, 70% of them were first-time ticket buyers mm -hmm. at the Coliseum. A lot of them bought tickets to come to the Auto Club, and they've become fans since then. Uh, 
and and the North Wilkesboro piece of, of having a throwback uh, moment, those kind of things are are what what wakes us all up to be reminded why we love this sport so much and are fans of it. This wasn't on the rundown, but I got to know. I got to know. I don't want to date you, but you've been going to Daytona a long time. Does the feeling, I say it every February, the feeling I get pulling through that turn four tunnel, seeing the palm trees blowing in the breeze, does that feeling ever go away? I got to know. No, it never goes away. And I don't care what you go through. I don't care what happens at Daytona that, that gives you maybe second thought. Uh, it, it, there's nothing like going through that tunnel. Um, and there's other places for me, but there's nothing like Daytona. It's like going, it's like you pull up into a whole new world. Oh, they didn't even know it was there. It's, it's, it's magic. It's like, it's, it's, <laughs> so a lot of the kids today can play electronic games and everything, virtual reality and all this. I can't, I can't imagine it. But I, if you, if you thought of a younger generation and all the abilities that you've got to do with that, if you think of driving through the tunnel at Daytona and you drove into a game field and being virtually a part of an oh my gosh facility, that's what it still feels like to me in Daytona. Is I'm not sure that I'm really here, but I'm going to enjoy every second of it. Yeah, it's the, it's a special place, man. Oh yeah, the the access from the drivers and and from the league. Also, I think the hardest ones to get access from are the teams. So, like, we see Race for the Championship, letting camera crews follow their guys into the haulers. Is In years past, there was stuff that they didn't want people in the shop to see. And, and with the next-gen car, that, that's kind of all gone to the wayside because everybody has the same stuff. But one thing that I've always wanted access to is, like, when they come over the radio and say, driver, the crew chief, the 12 to the, to the hauler after this, is there any, is, is there any good stories or any ones that you care to share that maybe stick out in your mind of, uh, some of your best post-race hauler meetings. Because also, <laughs> like all the fans know, is the 12 car driver and crew chief called to the hauler. Yeah. <laughs> what happens in the hauler? I know when I worked for Tony and he'd come back from that, it was always, you could tell how it went by looking at his face, but it was always, uh, it was always kind of comical. Yeah. We, so I've always been, and then, and I'll, I'll go to my grave this way of keeping those stories to myself, but I, I got to tell you, some of them people wouldn't believe. I mean, it, it, and some of them have been told, not by us, yeah. just by the osmosis of what come out of it after the fact. But that, um, and I don't think it's like that today as much as it used to be. I think, you know, our rules and regulations are more, we try to make it more black and white to where as the race unfolds, you handle all these things. Every now and then, and, the, and the, quite frankly, I tell you, the quality of crew members and drivers and everything is at a point where you really don't have to have those principal moments with, with the students anymore. Uh, not like it was, you know, in those days. But I wouldn't have traded that part for anything in the world, even though it was uncomfortable. And you really didn't want to have them. But it was kind of, I thought, and it still is, we just do it differently. Is It's our responsibility to say, look, that's not good for the sport, you know. And you can be mad if you want to, and you can do these things. and Or you can just, you know, just you, you some of the – well, I, I can't. I've got to be careful because I'll get into a role here. But there's a lot of personalities uh, present and past that that come out in the in the in the hauler up there that that tells you why. I've always said this sport's got a lot of character, and it does because of the characters in it. And that those meetings in the haulers were a perfect example of that. There's a lot of bulldogs going into the lounge of that trailer and a lot of chihuahuas coming back out, though. I know that. <laughs> well, yeah. it goes both ways. <laughs> Sometimes we go in barking and we come out purring, you know. So, yeah. so I mean, it, it goes both ways. Man, what a great conversation. I just want to keep talking all day. We ask some generic questions to most of our guests here, and you're one of the most special ones, but you get the same ones. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to change it for you. Yeah. I asked the drivers – if you had to pick one car and one racetrack to race at the rest of your life, what do you go with? But I'm going to adjust it for you. Okay. If you had to pick two drivers to watch go head to head, who are they? What era of car do you choose and what racetrack? Wow. There's so many of them. I don't think I can narrow it down, but I've, I've... how is Dave Pearson? Like, did you, did you watch him date? I, I watched him more as a fan. 
Now, yeah. I dealt with him when in Atlanta he was still driving, and I dealt with him as a track operator. But but I, David Pearson and Richard Petty were more of what made me a fan. But I, I, I've always enjoyed a great relationship with Richard Petty and Dale Inman and, mm -hmm. and you know, the Glenn and Leonard Wood and now Lenny and Eddie Wood uh, that are absolute incredible contributors to our history and particularly my experience in this, this history. But when it comes to racing on the racetrack, obviously watching every weekend, the 21 and the 43, we're going to be players somehow, some way. Uh, and then in today's world, I think there's more when you open up or when you, when you get ready to start the race, you know, there's, you don't know what's going to happen and you don't know who those, but there are still drivers that you like to see race each other on the racetrack. Even today, the, the, the one part of our history that I think I might've got the greatest pleasure from was the era actually when your dad was in the Bush series. And, and, and he and William Bumgarner were kind of laid the, the standard down because the it was the Bush series was still kind of young back then. And then he get up to the era with Matt Kenseth and Dale Jr. for two or three years. And that 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 watching that era of the Bush series was very influential on our growth, but it was also something I always enjoyed uh going and watching. And now you flash forward and in the Xfinity Garage, but particularly you know, we've got it everywhere right now. And I think that's why we're seeing fans get engaged again, because the personalities in our sport are as good as they've ever been. And you watch Noah Grayson or you watch Corey LaJoy and, and you watch them off the racetrack and you watch them on the racetrack. And that's what builds that, that fan following and connection. Because when, when we go through an era and uh, Richard Petty and David Pearson quit driving, Kale Yarbrough, then you go Darrell Waltrip, and then Dale Sr. goes away, but you lose Dale Jarrett and Rusty Wallace and Terry Labonte, and Jimmy. then you had Tony Stewart and, and Jeff Gordon and Jimmy Johnson, but then they go away. And you keep seeing the fans saying, well, you know, I was a, a Dale Sr. fan. Well, you know, then you got to decide if you're going to be a NASCAR fan or you're going to have to find somebody else to pull for. And I, you know, I think we've got a lot of characters that that are easy to pull for nowadays. I can only imagine how hard it was to navigate. Hang on a second. Being the president, he is not getting up until he gives me two names. <laughs> well, I was just gonna say, being the president when <laughs> Jimmy Johnson and Chad Knauss were winning their championships, because I can only imagine the people that were coming to you complaining about them because <laughs> they were so good. But I, that, I, I would, if I had to narrow it down to just two, yeah, it'd be Rusty Wallace and Dale Senior, and it'd be Martinsville. 98 or even earlier than that okay those two those two would would every martinsville it was it was the three and the two so if they raced 10 times what's the split who has more clocks uh well i, I guess the three car probably does but rusty's got a share of them because they were now that we had a lot of great characters at martinsville mm -hmm. uh and winners and everything but watching the two of them at those short tracks, where then I, I say Martinsville, but it was at North Wilkesboro and Richmond too. Yeah. Uh, but but that watching, you know, now in today's world, you see it come down to the end, and it reminds you of, of of that era. I usually ask, what was the most embarrassed you've ever been at the racetrack? But I'll save you the question. Thank you. Because I wanted to talk about. <laughs> but you, you touched on the the Rock coming out of the, story. coming out of the control tower after something like Rocky Nam. Yeah. So you kind of touched on that. So I want to talk about the Landmark Award, Hall of Fame. What's that mean to you? It, it's 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 humbling because I never felt like I deserved. I always enjoyed celebrating other people's career in this sport. Uh, and I think the Hall of Fame is one of the greatest additions we've had because it houses history for people to come and, and see firsthand that we didn't have before. We had... We had uh, the Alabama International Motorsports Hall of Fame. We had the NMPA Museum in Darlington. But having a NASCAR Hall of Fame, I think, is important. So being part of that is humbling to me because I just don't feel like I deserve to be in the hall with even in the landmark list with, with Jim France and Raymond Parks and Andy B. France and, 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 and Clay Earls, the people that really dug in and made this sport even possible. I just it feels kind of funny to me to be done that, but it, it now that doesn't mean it takes away from the honor of being recognized and and being able to to I, I just I just I have a lot of problem with it, but 
but it's it's a great honor. Well, I'm going to speak for everybody saying if there's a NASCAR Hall of Fame and you're not in it, it's not a true Hall of Fame. I appreciate that. So I appreciate you jumping on. Thank you so much for coming right here on Stacking Pennies. Hope you guys enjoyed it.